I have come to the conclusion that the extraordinary nature of the final movement of Beethoven's sixth string quartet requires a different approach from the one I've taken so far in this series, that of giving more or less equal attention to all four movements in a single video. That's because this final movement is so unusual and would require so much comment to begin to do it justice that a video dealing with the entire quartet in the usual way would be so long as to constitute a serious impediment to watching it. So I've decided to single out this movement for independent treatment and will let this suffice as my comment over movement for when the time comes, within a couple of days certainly, to post the completed project. And looking ahead, I believe that will also be a good strategy to follow when I get much further along in this accounting of Beethoven's quartets and the time comes to take up Opus 130, which happens to be in the same key, treating the Grossa Fuga finale separately and then incorporating it into the whole as a follow-up project. Put simply, there are two features of this movement that set it apart from everything else in Opus 18 and indeed from all the string quartet music composed to that date, so far as I'm aware. One is its highly eccentric form, which seems to honor several historical precedents while violating them all. The other is its daring harmonic profile, which includes a couple of radical tonal disjunctions that simply cannot be accounted for in common practice terms, and must therefore be considered, well, expressionistic is the word that comes to my mind. Because this movement is so unusual, and also because I can't even guarantee that I'll still think the same thing about it six months from now, my plan is to shed some light on the procedures I go through when making an analysis of any unfamiliar composition. I obviously don't start out with full knowledge of how a piece of music works. I discover that in the act of analysis. What you see in each of my analytical videos is an artifact of my journey of musical discovery. In case you're interested in doing the same kind of thing, here is a brief description of my approach to music that is unknown to me. I start with the same kinds of assumptions that would probably have been entertained by an educated concert goer in Beethoven's time, such as an amateur musician with a reasonable background in music theory, familiar with the models provided by the Haydn Mozart generation, but unfamiliar with the work under review and about to experience it for the first time. I begin by assuming that some time-honored pattern will apply, expecting that the music under examination will unfold along familiar lines. This means that sonata form is a good starting assumption for longer movements, while other possibilities, usually applying to inner movements, include variation form, da capo dance form, rondo form, or a simple ABA pattern. More often than not, this approach turns up exactly what I'm after, with everything I encounter in the new piece taking its appropriate place in my growing memory of it and performing its assigned function within an overall sonata shape with its three large sections exhibiting the traditional harmonic relations. Up to this point in Opus 18, 23 movements in all, there has been, despite plenty of novelty, nothing formally impenetrable. But this movement is an outlier in just about every thinkable respect, and it will not do to try to force it into a mold that it doesn't fit. So I want to propose that we try to put ourselves in the position of a music lover such as I've already begun describing, an enthusiastic and well-informed amateur who plays the cello in household ensembles that include friends and family, familiar with the way sonata form works and able, therefore, to keep their place in unfamiliar music at first hearing by referring back to that venerable pattern. We will assume that our fantasized auditor has a good ear and good pitch memory and is thus able to recognize when the second group appears first in the dominant key and later in the tonic. Let's imagine ourselves in a small theater in Vienna in 1802. We're here for a concert of some of the latest quartet music, including one with a growing reputation, a B-flat major string quartet recently published by a still young Ludwig von Beethoven. We've both heard and played lots of music by Haydn and Mozart, as well as some of Beethoven's earlier compositions. We know what to expect, 
It is our expectations that will make it possible to understand just how extraordinary this movement is as we listen to it for the first time and without benefit of the score. I will, however, show you the entire score in order to reinforce my points. This is what we hear and what we must reckon with. The movement opens with some slow music that one might at first hearing be forgiven for identifying as a slow introduction to a fast movement in sonata form. Although this is a somewhat unusual approach where final movements are concerned, it's not altogether unknown. Compare the fourth movement of the same composer's first symphony written about the same time. There, the main theme is foreshadowed in a brief, slow introduction that consists of nothing more than a rising scale attempted five times before a breakthrough on the sixth. But as the present movement unfolds, it soon becomes apparent that this is not a typical slow introduction. In fact, this broad-paced music, dubbed Melancholia, which comes with a directive to play it with utmost delicacy, is greatly extended, thoroughly thematic, and will, in the final reckoning, occupy about half the playing time for this movement. As one listens and those facts present themselves, it will become obvious that the form of this movement is novel, and one had better take notes. I'll talk a little about the contents of this opening chapter, but don't lose sight of what I've said about it so far. It begins in a state of hushed reverence with a serene, tonic, prolonging phrase in B-flat major played by the upper three instruments. That phrase is echoed forthwith an octave lower, but with a harmonic twist at its cadence, and the continuation edges into C minor. It is soon afterward that we hear the first radical harmonic shift on this second inversion B minor triad, which has absolutely nothing to do with C minor. It is a wrenching harmonic disjunction underscored by its subito pianissimo and the protracted chiaroscuro-like response with its angry outbursts is unsettling, to put it mildly. These combative chords lead in no obvious way to an E major condition, and there we reach our first big half cadence in the form of a phrase that recalls the opening, but now lying a tritone distant. The mode shifts to E minor, and the second important thematic idea begins, a simple four-note figure whose fourth note repeatedly becomes a hinge to the next tier in a melodically descending sequence that slowly cycles clockwise around the circle of fifths, coming finally to a splendid arrival in C major. Again, the mode shifts, and a new sequence begins, this one of a repeated pattern rising by whole steps and resolving into G minor for another go at that new thematic idea, now made threatening with second beats Fortsandi and winding down into A minor with Neapolitan darkness covering its cadential approach. Although the listener cannot know this at first hearing, this part of the journey is almost over, and it has taken such a long time to get here that one might be justified in concluding by this point that Beethoven intended to finish his sixth quartet quite inexplicably with a slow movement tinged with tragedy, something that Tchaikovsky actually did in his sixth symphony about nine decades later. But of course, A minor cannot be the goal of a quartet in B flat major, so a final passage that mounts inexorably to a terrifying climax provides the pivot back into the primary key, and the fast portion of the movement is now ready to begin three and a half minutes after the Malinconia music started. This is extraordinary already, but one still might be justified in assuming, once they hear the beginning of the Allegro, that one has heard a slow introduction to a fast movement in sonata form. That would be in keeping with time-honored patterns, although we'd more likely encounter such patterns in first movements than in final ones, and the temporal proportions are certainly unusual. The first theme is a very cheerful and agreeable waltz-like tune in continuous semiquavers, and its shape is a clear-cut 16-bar parallel period with full closure on the tonic in its final measure. Such compact, self-contained themes are, by the way, more typical of rondo form than of sonata form, and our educated early 19th century auditor would be aware of this. File that away for future reference. 
There is a transition whose beginning is clearly derived from theme one, and it will also be important to keep its derived melodic shape in mind for later, much later, reference. Over the course of 16 measures of continuous directed music, the modulation to F major is achieved, and the second group, such as it is, begins. The first member of that group closes definitively on the new tonic after a mere eight measures and a second statement begins only to be absorbed forthwith in a new project to be identified in my analysis as theme 2b. Let's do a little accounting for future reference. The first theme was a mere 16 measures long, the transition 16. Theme 2A, a meager 13 before being overridden like subducting oceanic crust under the leading edge of a continent by theme 2B, which enjoys 14 measures under the sun before being elided by what is clearly a closing passage in F major derived from theme 1. This is the dependent closing one expects at the end of an exposition, and, as is often the case in such movements, the harmony soon begins to trend back toward a new beginning in B-flat major, such as one would hear on the approach to an exposition repeat. Remember that we've put ourselves in the position of someone who is conversant with the mechanics of 18th century music, but who is unfamiliar with this particular quartet. So when they hear the return of the main theme, presented pretty much as at the beginning of this short exposition, they would naturally conclude that one of two things is true. Either this is an exposition repeat in sonata form, which would certainly be the case if this were an opening movement, not a final one, or it's the first return of the refrain in sonata rondo terms, a reasonable conclusion since, as I pointed out, the harmonically compact, self-contained nature of the first theme suggests its use as a refrain. There is, however, the inconvenient fact that this movement opened with a stretch of very slow music that was three and a half times the length of the minute-long exposition we just heard. That would be strikingly unusual. Sonata Rondo movements typically begin forthwith, not with a slow introduction, especially one so outsized. Our hypothesized listener continues their journey through this first hearing. The first theme is followed by transitional music, remember its profile from earlier, but now set in the parallel minor. Now this sounds for all the world like the beginning of a development section, so by now the working assumption in the mind of our auditor is no doubt that of a sonata rondo movement with the stormy developmental fireworks now set to begin. But those fireworks never materialize. What we have here is instead a restatement of the transition, but enlarged by a couple of measures that facilitate a doubling back into B-flat major for the arrival of the second group in the tonic key. And things just got a whole lot more complicated for now. This can no longer be considered a sonata rondo movement as there has been no development whatsoever. So the model that now seems to apply is sonatina form, the most modest version of sonata form. But that must mean that the supposedly introductory music, a slow 3.5 minute crawl, has introduced the most minimally proportioned main body imaginable. Surely this can't be right. Our listener now sits in a state of complete bewilderment, but let's assume dogged persistence. They're still listening, still assimilating, still as determined to get to the bottom of it as we are. At the end of this short recapitulation, the closing is set in motion again, but this time it's a lot more active harmonically, worked out further, grows menacingly, and finishes dramatically on a common tone diminished seventh chord that resolves into the return of the Malinconia music in its original key. What an extraordinary thing this is. Notice that this return begins with a resolution on the 6-4 chord of B-flat major, not on the tonic directly for a new beginning, but almost as though a cadenza were being set into motion. And look how the harmony destabilizes in the fifth measure, slipping again into C minor, but sooner than earlier. And then, once again, we get that radical harmonic disjunction, but in the eighth bar, not the twelfth. 
A brief outburst turns the music toward A minor. Again, we saw this on our first pass through this music, but everything is more concentrated now, a formal stretto, you could say. And the first theme tries to emerge in that key. This is all unprecedented. The only thing our listener could conclude, I think, is that the development that was omitted in the main body of the movement has now finally arrived, with the Malinconia music being developed along with the first theme. And things continue in that vein, with the next attempt being in G major. But it doesn't take long for Beethoven to find his way back to the tonic key for another complete statement of the main theme, now embellished with new counterpoint. Are you completely lost yet? Hang in there, we're nearing the end of the ride. The music that follows that final return of the refrain is both new and vaguely familiar, a new theme certainly modeled on the transition whose melodic profile I encouraged you to remember earlier. Here it is again, now in the form of music that has the quality of a summation and valediction. In the analysis you will see shortly, I have identified this as theme three, and, surprise, it is the longest theme in the fast body of this movement, half again as long as the compact 16-bar refrain. This is followed, finally, by a multi-part coda whose chief concern is the main theme, and I will let that speak for itself when we hear the movement in its entirety. Now, what on earth is our fantasy listener to conclude about the form of the extraordinary movement they just heard? Clearly, it makes reference to several models without being an example of any of them. After several shots at this analysis, this is what I have finally arrived at. It may be that there are better ways of understanding the overall shape of it, and I do know that I'm not entirely convinced by what I've come up with, but at least it's a way of keeping one's place as the movement unfolds, and it does account for everything that happens in the movement. I've started by jettisoning that sonatina possibility and instead considering this a movement with two expositions, the first of which includes the by no means insignificant Malinconia music, certainly no mere slow introduction, and the second of which also behaves like a recapitulation in that the second group returns in the tonic key. But I've reserved that recapitulatory function for the third big section, which at first follows the pattern of the first exposition, but with the Malinconia music reduced and the fast movement that succeeds it also pared down. Since the return of Malinconia begins off harmonic center and is interspersed with first theme fragments that explore alien keys, I have noted that the beginning of this recapitulation is also developmental in character, thus satisfying two formal demands simultaneously. And the theme I identified as theme three provides a summation of all that has happened and seems to say something like, and they lived happily ever after. The coda then wraps it all up with final reference to the main theme, experienced from three different tempo perspectives and finishing with utmost bravura. After struggling with this movement for days, that's what I have to offer. Now let's see if there's anything to it.
Thank you. 